I gave this uh, series of lectures here in the Roscoff in 2017. And uh, well, I had no lecture notes ready, but uh, they wanted to publish lecture notes. So I was forced to, to write some. So some are available now. And as I, well, as uh, Rajan said, yeah, well, I will give them to you, yeah. But w what I would like also is to keep, yeah, trace of your name, yeah. So if you could, oh, if you could just send me an email, yeah, to, you, you saw the email address in red color, yeah. So that, well, I may easily, easier identify you. And uh, if we need to interact in the future, it will be nice. So this is my email address, yeah, J-S-U-R-D-E-J, harobas, U-L-G, dot A-C, dot B-E, yeah. So it would be good if you just send me an email. OK. So, well, in addition, yeah, to lecture notes, yeah, uh, my wife Anna yeah, is going to videotape yeah, the lectures. So if later on yeah, you forgot about something or would, would like to see once more a demonstration, well, it's very useful. Yeah? We do that um, for all the lectures. Yeah? I'm giving, and uh, well, all, all the videotapes yeah, are freely available yeah, on the internet. Yeah? So this is very handy. Okay, so I will just start now here and uh, just show you well pre preliminary table of contents. Yeah, so first I will start with an introduction, general introduction. Yeah, to let you know what will be the content. Yeah, of these lectures. Then I will proceed with some reminders. Yeah, that we need uh, to understand uh, well the theory yeah, of uh, interferometry. Well. Brief history about the measurements of stellar diameters. You will see that you know uh, many scientists yeah, thought about you know how estimating the size of a star in the past. Yeah. Then I will address yeah, the problem of light coherence. Then uh, just mention uh, examples yeah, of uh, major interferometers yeah, that you could uh, perhaps one day use yourself. Yeah. And then I will end up yeah, with the three important theorems and some applications to give you a better and deeper insight yeah, in the theory of uh, interferometry. So I will just start with the introduction. You know, very often, yeah, when people uh, ask, well, would it be possible to have a look at a star with a telescope? Yeah, and then we show them yeah, a star, and they say, well. Show me another one, and well, it still looks about the same, yeah? No difference. And indeed, if we would be above the Earth's atmosphere, and we would look, yeah, with a telescope having a diameter D1, a very distant star, what we would see in the focal plane of the telescope, yeah, is just a dot of light, yeah? A dot of light which doesn't contain any information about the size, the shape, the temperature, the luminosity of the star, neither about its distance, yeah? All stars look the same. It's just a hairy disk, an hairy disk, yeah? So it's a, well, pattern of light diffraction, yeah? And uh, wh wh what we know is that the angular diameter, yeah, between uh, the two first uh, minima, so you see here a dark fringe, yeah, is 2.44, times the wavelength divided by the diameter, yeah? So this is expressed in radians. So if you work at shorter wavelengths, well, the dot gets smaller, which is good because uh, the angular resolution of your instru instrument improves. Or if you would increase the diameter, well, it would be better. And this is what is illustrated on the next slide, yeah? Now, we have a telescope with a diameter D2, which is bigger, larger than D1. And what you see is that, well, the size of the central dot of light yeah, is smaller. Yeah? So it's better. The angular resolution improves. Yeah? So by increasing either the diameter of the telescope or working at shorter wavelengths, yeah, you improve the angular resolution of your telescope. And therefore, we have a space telescope yeah, above the Earth's atmosphere, yeah, the HST because well, it can work well down to ultraviolet wavelengths, yeah? So very short wavelengths. And the diameter, well, it's quite uh, important, 2.4 meter. 
Okay, so well, astronomers uh, have always dreamt about uh, constructing bigger and bigger, bigger telescopes, yeah? But still, there is a limit, yeah? Well, from a technological point of view, in uh, the maximum size that you could uh, construct a telescope. And nowadays, yeah, the te technology doesn't allow you to go far beyond 40 meters, yeah? So you have the ELT project, you have the TMT project, you have the GMT project, yeah? Okay. So this is very unfortunate. Okay, now let's assume we are le looking now at an extended object, yeah? Well, a kind of a Earth like planet, yeah? Well, it's very clear, yeah, that by using a telescope with a larger size, yeah, you would see more details yeah, on the extended object, yeah? Because in fact, uh, this image would just be the convolution product, yeah? of the point spread function by the real image of the object you're looking at. I'll come back to that, you know, in more details later. Well, fortunately, yeah, in 1868, Fizeau and Stefan, yeah, uh, proposed, or they just realized that in terms of angular resolution, two small apertures, yeah, separated by a distance of B, so this is the baseline, yeah, well, are equivalent to a single large aperture of diameter B, yeah? And this is fantastic, yeah? yeah? That they realized it, yeah? So it means that if you would separate these two telescopes by a distance of 400 meters, you could recover, yeah, along that direction, an angular resolution that would be equivalent to that of a single dish telescope, yeah, having a size of 400 meters, yeah? And for 400 meters is typically the baseline achieved by the Shara array in uh, Mount Wilson. And well, uh, VLTI yeah, goes up to about 200 meter baseline. So, this is good news. Now, instead of observing yeah, an airy disk yeah, in the focal plane of such an interferometer, what you would see is still an airy disk, yeah? still an airy disk, but crossed yeah, by interference fringes, which are alternately yeah, bright and dark, bright and dark, bright and dark. And now the interfringe, so the separation between two bright fringes, yeah, is just about equal to lambda over B, where B is a baseline yeah, between that separates the two telescopes. So this is, uh, this is a very positive news, of course. OK, now let's have a look. Yeah? If you observe yeah, an extended object yeah, with a small size telescope, this is what you would see yeah, from a very distant Earth-like planet. By increasing the size, well, let's, let's go to TMT. Well, it would already be improved, but if you would be using yeah, well, an interferometer with still a baseline 10 times larger, you would see 10 times more details yeah, along the line joining the two yeah, single pupils. Okay, now, what you see exactly when using a telescope or an interferometer, yeah, as I said before, and we will see it in more detail during the lecture, yeah, this is just an introduction, yeah, is a product of convolution of the point spread function. So the point spread function is the image you would see with uh, that instrument of a very distant point-like star, convolved with a real image of the source, yeah? So I may write it, it like that. That the distribution in intensity is a function of the angular coordinates. These are the angular coordinates in the sky, yeah? zeta and eta. Is just equal yeah, to the convolution product of the PSF. So point spread function. What you would see yeah, if uh, the object is point like a star. This is a convolution product, yeah, times well, the ideal yeah, distribution of light of the extended object you are looking at. And th this you don't know, of course. You only observe this, yeah? Now, as you know, if you take the free transform, yeah, of the left hand quantity, it would be equal to the free transform of the right one. And you would find that the free transform of the intensity 
is equal to the Fourier transform of the PSF times, uh, this is a natural product, the Fourier transform of the real intensity. And now you say, well, well, the quantity I would like to recover is that one. Yeah? So how to do? Well, it's easy. You divide this quantity by this one, PSF, like this. And you find that Fourier transform of what you're looking at, of what you're searching for, yeah, is equal to the the co 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 caution yeah, of those two, two quantities. Now, what you would do, you would take the inverse Fourier transform of this would be equal to the inverse Fourier transform of that. And now this would give you exactly the quantity you are interested in, yeah? So this equation yeah, seems to, to, to show you that in principle, you could recover yeah, the real intensity distribution of the object, of the extended object, yeah? By taking the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform of your observation divided by the Fourier transform of the PSF, yeah? And this would work, yeah, if you would have a very good coverage of the UV plane in space frequencies, yeah? But usually, it, this is very difficult to achieve, yeah? So, if uh, the Fourier space, yeah, is only sparsely covered, so you will have a few data points, then what you would do, you would use a model. And while adopting a priori a model, you're looking at an object and you suspect that it is a binary star, so you, you would say, okay, I know that I have two point-like components separated by a given distance and a certain orientation, and still probably you would be able to recover yeah, what is a real angular separation between the two stars and what is the flux ratio between the two stars. Yeah? So, okay. So this is just an introduction yeah, to, to show you what we will cover during these lectures. Yeah? And I will go into more details and we will understand exactly yeah, how, to, how to derive those quantities. Okay. So now, I will start with uh, some reminders. First, concerning uh, the representation of the electromagnetic wave, and after we go to the principle of Huygens Fresnel. So, as most of you know, yeah, when we are looking uh, at objects in the sky, well, most of these are not resolved, yeah, with the exception of the moon or the sun, yeah. But even Jupiter, Venus, yeah, we, we cannot resolve them with our eye, yeah. And so the subject of the less of the lecture today is something like that, yeah. Let's assume that you are looking yeah, at uh, the bulb of light, yeah, very thin filament, yeah. And uh, you are very, very far away, yeah. So let's say 10 meters, yeah. Would you be able, yeah, to estimate the linear diameter of the filament of the of the bulb? We'd say no. Well, after the pause, yeah, so in about an hour from now, you see we will construct, yeah, well, each of us, yeah, a small interferometer that would enable you to find what is the linear diameter of the bulb of the light, yeah? So, well, we, we have here some aluminum paper, some needles, etc., and we will construct a small interferometer that will enable you to to estimate yeah, what is the thickness yeah, of the bulb of light. Yeah? So let's assume you are outside and you see a, well, a, a bulb of light yeah, at the distance of 10 meters. You could use that instrument, look at it, and find what is the linear diameter. It's a micro or milli interferometer. Yeah? Now astronomers do the same with the stars. Yeah? So they are observing a very, very distant stars with interferometers. And now here I have represented yeah, the linear diameter, two times the radius, yeah, of course, yeah. Now delta, big delta, is twice the angular radius. Now what is angular radius? Well, the angular radius, or I would say the tangent of the angular radius, yeah, is equal to the rad linear radius of the star divided by its distance, yeah, z. Okay, this is easy. Now. There is a nice relation yeah, between 
the flux, small f, that you observe from a distant star and the flux at the surface of the star. So how to derive the relation? Well, the luminosity of a star you know, is equal to the surface yeah, of, of, of the star, yeah, which is assumed to be a sphere, multiplied by its intrinsic flux. Yeah? Now, conservation yeah, of the flux, you can also say, well, at a distance z, the sphere yeah, is much larger. Yeah? And if I multiply it by the apparent flux observed on Earth, yeah, I still have this equality. So z is the distance between the observer and the star. f is the apparent flux. This is the flux at the surface of the star, and this is the radius of the star. Yeah? So from this relation, you see that if I divide r over z square, this is equal to small f divided by big f square. But r over z, this is the angular radius. Yeah? So this is equal to rho square. And from this relation, yeah, I may just infer that where well, the absolute flux yeah, of the star is equal to the apparent flux, there is no, no square here. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. So f, big F is equal to small f yeah, times 1 over rho square. Correct? Yep. So you see that by if you know yeah, what is the angular radius of a star, Measuring its apparent flux on Earth, you may estimate yeah, what is the stellar flux, yeah? so the, the flux at the surface of the star. Now, if you make use yeah, of the Stefan, Stefan Boltzmann law, yeah, you know that uh, so the absolute flux of the star is proportional yeah, to the power number four of the effective temperature. So which means that the effective temperature of a star is equal to the flux divided by the constant of Stefan Boltzmann, yeah? At the power one over four. And now if you make use of the flux here, you find that it is equal to small f over sigma this is at the power of one quarter in divided now by one over the square root of rho. Correct? I hope. Well, I'm not sure, but about this one, are you? Do you find the same result or not? It's okay. Yeah. If you say it's okay, it must be okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So what, what, what is fantastic yeah, is that by just measuring the angular radius of a star, yeah, you may get an estimate of its effective temperature. Yeah. And this has been a major use yeah, of a stellar interferometry to provide yeah, reliable estimates of the effective temperature of stars, yeah, which enter you know when you make uh, solar evolution calculations yeah, and model atmospheres. Yeah. Okay, now I come to speak about a uh, beam of light radiation. Yeah? So a beam of light radiation can be assimilated yeah, to the propagation of a multitude yeah, of electromagnetic, electromagnetic waves yeah, with velocity of 300,000 kilometers per second. Yeah? Well, in the vacuum, of course. Yeah? And now, well, this is a representation yeah, of the electric field well, assuming that the wave yeah, is a plane, is uh, linearly polarized, yeah, that its frequency is nu, the wavelength lambda, yeah, and if I represent yeah, the propagation of the electric field yeah, as a function of time or as a function yeah, of the distance along one direction, represented by the abscissa z, this is yeah, a nice representation yeah, 
of how it varies. Yeah? So lambda is a wavelength, yeah? nu is a frequency, and big T is a period. So now we visualize yeah, the propagation of this uh, wave, either as a function of time or as a function of the z-axis. Yeah? Le let's assume that we free the time. So t equals 0. Yeah? So it would be the propagation as a function of z. Yeah? And the separation between uh, two crests yeah, would be equal, of course, to the wavelengths, yeah? to the wavelengths of the light. Now, you could consider that we stay at the same spot yeah, along the z-axis, for instance, z equals 0. Yeah? And look how the waves vary as a function of time. Now, the separation yeah, between two crests yeah, would be the period, yeah? t, equal 1 over nu. Now, by multiplying, of course, t by c, the velocity of light, this is equal, equivalent to the wavelengths. Yeah? OK, now, so it's very convenient yeah, to represent yeah, this expression yeah, in the complex form. Yeah? This follows. Well, the electric field yeah, is represented by the real, well, the real part yeah, of the product of the real amplitude, A, so this is a real quantity, multiplied by the complex exponential function, yeah, which is the following one. Well, wh wh why it's very convenient is because what, what we will do, we will drop yeah, the real part, then we will essentially well, operate linear transformation on the electric field, and uh, just after, at the end of your calculations, yeah, you would take the real part of the, of the result yeah, and would find uh, what you're searching for. Now, the fact that it is very convenient is due to the fact that you can represent yeah, this complex exponentiation yeah, as the product of two quantities, one which essentially depends on the time variable and one which depends on the space variable. Yeah? OK, so, so it is shown here. So I abandon yeah, the real part. Yeah? So then we make a linear operation. And at the end, we will take again yeah, the real part. But let's forget it for the moment. So this is a part which depends on the time variable. And now this is the part which depends on the space variable, yeah? where phi is equal to 2 pi times z over lambda. Yeah? And now this, the product of these two quantities, yeah? we will represent it as being the complex amplitude yeah, of the electric field. So the previous expression is represented as follows. And this is the complex amplitude yeah, of the electromagnetic field. So I will use it later on. And so just should just write it down on the blackboard so that we don't forget it. So the electric field can be represented as a product of the complex amplitude, yeah, A time I2 pi nu t. So A equals the product of the real amplitude time exponentiation of minus phi. <coughs> with phi equal to 2 pi z over lambda. <coughs> now, unfortunately, yeah, unlike uh, when you're observing the radio, yeah, it is impossible yeah, to measure the variation of the electric field yeah, as a function of time. Yeah, because well, the frequency is much too high. Yeah? Well, typically, the wavelengths, uh, visible wavelengths, 5,000 angstrom, yeah, the frequency yeah, of uh, the electric field yeah, is something like 6 times 10 to the power 14 hertz. Yeah? So it's much too fast. Yeah? So if you'd like to get the Next Nobel Prize, yeah, try to find an instrument that is capable of measuring yeah, the variation of the amplitude with such a frequency. Yeah. OK, so the only thing you can measure yeah, is the intensity. Yeah? And the intensity is the time average of the energy yeah, passing through a surface element per unit of time per solid angle. Yeah? 
and placed perpendicularly yeah, to the propagation of the beam. So it's given, yeah, so the intensity <coughs> is proportional to the temporal average of the square of the electric field. So it's given by that expression. And if you replace yeah, uh, the quantity E by what we had before, well, I could say, OK, E equal uh, A times co cosine of uh, 2 pi nu t. What you would find is that the intensity is equal to 1 over 2t times integration from minus t to plus t of. So the square of this quantity would give you a square times cos square 2 pi nu t dt. OK, now well, you can make use of the following relation, yeah? Cos of 2x equal 2 times cos square x minus 1, yeah? So you would find that this is equal to a square over 2t multiplied by minus t at t of, I will extract it from here, so it would be 1 plus the cosine of 4 pi nu t divided by 2 times dt. Now, when, when you will integrate yeah, this quantity, cosine, it, you will find a sine, yeah? But which will vary yeah, over, uh, well, many periods. Of time, yeah? Which means that its contribution will be equal to zero. And what will remain is just a square over 2t divided by 2. And then if you integrate 1 between minus t and plus t, you'll get 2t here. So the 2t, 2t two two disappear. And you find that it's equal to a square divided by 2. So this is interesting. We find that the intensity well, is proportional to the square of the real amplitude, yeah? And uh, by convention, yeah, well, astronomers uh, are defining the intensity of the electric field, yeah, as uh, being just equal to the square of the real amplitude, yeah? Which is also, yeah, the square, yeah, of the module of the complex amplitude, yeah? And which is also equal, of course, to the complex amplitude times its conjugate complex, yeah? So these are just reminders, yeah, just reminders, which will be important yeah, for the remainder of the lecture. Now I come to the principle of Huygens Fresnel. But before going there, is there any question? I mean here, that's all of that is still clear, yeah. So let's go now to the principle of Huygens Fresnel, yeah. So following Huygens, yeah. The propagation yeah, of the wave front yeah, can be assimilated yeah, to, well, if you take any part yeah, of a, a wave front, yeah, it is as if yeah, it, was, uh, it could be considered as emitting yeah, a wavelet, yeah, secondary wavelet. And so you take all the points yeah, along these wave fronts. After a certain time t, yeah, you look where are the wavelets. And now you take the, the wave fronts yeah, of all those wavelets. And what you find is that, well, the propagation of this plane wave after a certain time is still a plane wave, yeah? You can do the same for a spherical waves. So here is a spherical wave at the time t. So you consider different points of the spherical waves. Now, wavelets yeah, are being emitted, yeah, by all these points. And after a time delta t, you take the wave fronts of all the secondary wavelets, and what you find he said, wow, well, it's, it's still a spherical waves, yeah? You just have to consider a very large number of uh, secondary points, yeah? And so this is a principle of Huygens, and Fresnel had it, the fact that you should, yeah, 
Also consider the interference between the wavelets. So if two wavelets yeah, oscillate and uh, touch each other or in phase, yeah, then their amplitude, their amplitude will just be co-headed yeah, if they are in, uh, well, opposite, uh, if, if they are also oscill oscillating in a position, yeah, then the resulting amplitude will be zero. Yeah? And by just, uh, so, adding, you know, this inter interference between the wavelets to the principle, construction principle of Huygens, yeah? Well, Fresnel has been able, yeah, to account for the diffraction effects, yeah? Caused by uh, optical light, yeah? For instance, if you, if you take uh, the objective, yeah, of a telescope and let a wavefront, yeah? Plain a wavefront, yeah, falling onto it, yeah? Well, the wavefront tends to to go around this obst obstacle, yeah, and then uh, the wavelets are interfering, and the result is that at the focal plane, what you are observing, yeah, is not a dot of light, yeah, but it is an airy disk, yeah, airy disk due to the interf interference. So, of course, we consider here that we are working with monochromatic light, yeah. So you you see that during the, these lectures. Uh, we, we will have the tools, we will develop the tools, yeah, to estimate exactly, yeah, what is the size of the airy disk and what, what is the expression, yeah, which may account for its light distribution. Okay. Now, well, this is interesting for the experiment that we shall do in a moment, yeah. Uh, the angular resolution of our eye, yeah, is given still by this same expression, yeah, 2.44 lambda over d, uh, where d is the diameter of our pupil, yeah, and where typically our pupil, yeah, have a dimension that may vary between one and five millimeters, yeah. If you make the calculation, transform the regions in second of arc, you would find that uh, when your eye, yeah, is the size of about one millimeter, its angular resolution is about equivalent to two arc minutes, yeah? And when it's widely open, yeah? So up to five millimeters, yeah? Well, it's five times better, yeah? So it would be, well, two minutes of arc divided by five, yeah? Okay, so this gives you an idea. Okay, now, when you're using a small telescope, yeah? One centimeter, typically, a telescope, well, the diameter of the airy disk yeah, is something about 15 seconds of arc. Now, if you increase the size of your telescope up to 15 centimeter, it will be 15, centi 15 times smaller, yeah? So about one second of arc, yeah? And what is very unfortunate, yeah? Well, under our skies is that if we see increase the size, the diameter of the telescope, yeah? The angular resolution doesn't improve anymore, yeah? We are, well, our angular resolution is limited yeah, by the agitation yeah, in the atmosphere. So what, what, what happens is that there is a, typically at a height yeah, between five, 10 kilometers, yeah, we have a regime of eddies. Yeah, and uh, well, this is the atmosphere and typically the size of these cells yeah, may vary between uh, a few centimeters up to 20 centimeters under the best thing conditions. And so, well, in the focal plane of the telescope, yeah, well, it, it is as if, yeah, well, the only part of the mirror which are coherent, yeah, are of a size of about 20 centimeters or down to two centimeters, yeah, depending on the, on uh, the condition in the atmospheric layers, yeah. Now, if you take a monochromatic light, so if you observe with an interference filters, yeah, what will happen is that light passing here and light passing there could interfere, yeah? And uh, either uh, interfere positively or destructively. And what you would observe in the focal plane, yeah, is just a series of granules, yeah, called speckles, yeah? And still, the individual speckles would have an angular size given by 2.44 lambda over d, yeah? But if the size of your telescope is too big, you have so many speckles, yeah, that it looks like, you know, a very, uh, well, 
a very disturbing spot of light, which angular size is typically several seconds of arc or under the best conditions, yeah, one second of arc or half a second of arc, that's all, yeah. So this is very unfortunate yeah, for, well, amateur astronomers that beyond 15 centimeter, you don't gain any more in angular resolution, yeah, because of the atmosphere. Well, at Devastal, yeah, we, last year, yeah, we, we could take some images here yeah, where the, the size of the pond spot function was about half a second of arc, yeah, so it's a very promising site, yeah. Okay, now I come to the brief history about the measurement of stellar diameters, yeah. And everything starts with Galileo, Galilei, yeah, 1632. So the way he proceeds yeah, is as follows. He tries to get an estimate yeah, of a bright star. Yeah? Well, let's assume that it is Vega, a yeah, star of magnitude zero in the sky. So what, what, what he did, yeah, he just took, well, a very thin, uh, a very thin wire, yeah? and he let it hang, and then he put his eye yeah, behind, looking at, the, at Vega. Then, of course, if you, have to, if you are too far away, yeah, uh, what happens is that uh, you, you see the star, but then you get closer to the wire, and, well, from a minimum distance, yeah, the star gets occulted, yeah? And now it's estimate of the angular radius of Vega with the angular radius of the wire, yeah? So let's assume that the linear diameter of the wire is D, and the distance between the eye of Galileo to the wire is z, where the angular diameter of the wire would be d over z. And this would be twice the angular radius of the star. Yeah? And so he found, uh, proceeding that way, that the angular diameter of star is probably around 5 seconds of arc. Yeah? It's 5 seconds of arc. And this was already a kind of revolution, because before Galileo, yeah, people thought that the angular diameter of the star was about two arc minutes. Now, could I ask you, why two arc minutes? Why people thought that the angular diameter of the star was about two arc minutes? No. Two arc minutes? Resolution of the eye. Resolution of the eye. Now, if I come to the next question, yeah? Why Galileo estimated yeah, the angular diameter of the star to be five seconds of hour, yeah? So you're right. That, that was because of the thing when he was observing. If the thing would have been, yeah, thank you, five times better, yeah, he would have estimated that probably the angular diameter of the star is about one second of hour, yeah? So he was victim, yeah, of the atmospheric thing effects. Now, the next one, yeah, is Newton. Yeah, Newton. And when Newton did that, yeah, in a very, very clever way, yeah, really fantastic, yeah. Well, he proceeded as follows. When the sun is a visual magnitude, well, he didn't know exactly that it was minus 26.7 at that time, but the visual magnitude of the sun, yeah, is minus 26.7, yeah, right? So it's very bright. <laughs> And he said, well, let's assume that Vega is a star like the sun, yeah? So this was a very good, uh, well, very good uh, vision. In that I take the sun and put it farther and farther and farther away until its apparent magnitude gets equal to zero, yeah? Well, its angular diameter, yeah, would shrink, yeah, to a size which would be, well, the typical angular diameter of a star like Vega, yeah? So, the way he proceeded is as follow. Well, you know the relation, yeah, uh, according to which, well, the apparent magnitude, yeah, of uh, the sun minus, yeah, the apparent magnitude it would have if it was set at the distance of Vega, but Vega is an apparent magnitude of zero, yeah? So, I would say minus zero. Well, is equal to minus 2.5, times the logarithmic, logarithm in a base 10 of 
the flux of the sun, as we observe on Earth, right? Yeah. Divided by, well, the flux of the sun, yeah, if it was at the, at the distance of Vega. Correct? Okay. Now, I may rewrite this relation as follows. Okay, the flux of the sun, yeah, as seen from the Earth, well, is just equal to the luminosity of the sun divided by 4 pi z square, where z square, yeah, is the distance between the observer and the sun. Now, divided by the flux the sun would have if it was at the distance of Vega. So, well, this is also the luminosity of the sun divided by 4 pi. And here I would say, OK, the distance of the sun, if it was placed at the position of vega. Okay. Now, the, the nice thing here is that the luminosity of the sun here and luminosity of the sun here goes away. Yeah? 4 pi and 4 pi goes away. And now what I do, yeah, I will just insert yeah, the square of the radius of the sun above and below. So in the denominator and in the numerator. Yeah? So here I put r square sun, r square sun. Now what we obtain is that it's minus 2.5 times the logarithm of. OK. Can you tell me what that is? Yeah. So it's the quotient of the radius of the sun by the distance of the sun. It's the angular radius yeah, of the sun as seen from hers. OK, but so I just write here rho sun square. And now if you do the inverse, yeah, z is divided by that. Yeah. Well, here I forgot the square. Yeah. Yeah, so this is what? This is the angular radius of the sun if it was at the distance of vega. Yeah? So I could say, okay, like this, yeah. And from this relation, yeah, I find that, so here, this quantity minus zero, so it's uh, minus 26.7 minus zero. So the minus and minus goes away. And I find that from this relation, that 26.7 divided by 2.5, here I put 10 to the power of this quantity, is equal to the radius of the sun square divided by the radius of vega square. And finally, we find that the angular radius of vega is equal to the angular radius of the sun times 10 to the minus 26.7 divided by 2.5. And then I should still stay, take a square root, so divided by 5. Like that, OK? And if you do that calculation, yeah, so we know that this is a half a degree, 30 arc minutes, yeah? And if you make the calculation, yeah, well, Newton found that the angular radius of the sun, if it was placed at the distance of Vega, should be about 8 mini arc second. Yeah? So it was the first yeah, to get a, a good estimate of an angular radius of a star. Yeah? Yeah? And it, it's a very nice yeah? deduction. Now, if you would take, uh, of course, uh, the, the real apparent magnitude of the sun that we know today, well, we would find that uh, the value Oh no, so he, he estimated two, two million second rather than with the correct value of the apparent magnitude of the sun, we would find today that it is eight million arc second. But still, yeah, today we know by 
measurement, interferometric measurement that the real diameter of Vega yeah, is three milliarc seconds. Yeah? So he had a very good estimate yeah, of what the angular radius of a star should be. Yeah? So it's very nice. 